far as I know. 3.30, and it's time to begin with our next session. I'd like to introduce Nitesh Turaga of the core team, and now he is working at Dana-Farber and uh, making major contributions to Bioconductor, both in terms of the production of containers, the production of binary repositories that you can use to make your container-based computing uh, go very smoothly. And now he's going to talk about Bioconductor Doctor Images for multi-node parallel computing on the cloud. Thank you, Nitesh. Thanks, Vince. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Um, I don't know how to check on the folks who are uh, joining us virtually, but blink twice if you can hear me. Um, so I'll be talking today about uh, multi-node parallel computing on the cloud using Bioconductor Docker images. And um, first of all, I'd like to point you to the slides and the GitHub repo. So I'll just introduce the topic a little bit with some slides for about 30 minutes or so. And then we'll go into a demo where I'll launch an actual cluster, we'll do some uh, toy parallel computing to show you guys how it's done. Um, but interrupt me with any questions you have. Um, it's supposed to be an interactive sort of session. You can't follow along, unfortunately, unless you have a Google Cloud account and a credit card in the system. So that's why we didn't make it uh, a workshop. It's going to be just a long demo. Uh, I'll try to keep it interesting. Um, and if you have any questions, again, I insist that you just stop me and ask me questions so that we can have like a lively discussion. So I'll introduce the topic a little bit. So Bioconductor started around 2000, um, and the data back then was fairly small. They started with microarrays. Um, there's people here who can attest to the size of the data and like the computer infrastructure better than I can. Uh, but the idea then was R is like in-memory model computing. So you could use your local hardware to do all the analysis you wanted. And data size kept increasing. We got into like HPC, virtualized infrastructure like uh, virtual machines and all sorts of like different high performance computing measures as the data size kept increasing. And then in the last like six to eight years, it kept increasing like more and more. And now we need a scalable solution because we can now predict that data size keeps increasing. So now we're gonna use containers, cloud resources. So we pay for what we need on the cloud. So why do we need cloud and parallel computing? Firstly, because there's a lot of data uh, and the cost is also an important thing. We want to pay for what we use. Um, I can't find my mouse. Uh, and the competition for high performance computing resources in institutions is usually pretty bad. Like you have to fight with your colleagues. You can't get time on the compute node you want, so on and so forth. So let's think what a traditional parallel computing model is, right? So traditionally, like you would log in to like a head node of sorts, um, and this is on your HPC. Uh, did have people use like high performance computing infrastructure? Okay, great. A lot of people have. Um, so there's a head node you log into, and you'd have to choose the size of the worker nodes you want. You deploy your job, it comes back to you, and there's a file system backing it all up. The biggest problem is you don't have admin rights on any of these machines. So if you are an R user like I am, you'd need to install new packages, you'd need to install new software, new bioinformatics software, and they're usually not available, so you have to beg your admin, hey, can you please install this? And he's gonna say, I don't have time. Um, <laughs> And then you're gonna compete with your coworkers. There's wait times because someone's gonna take up the largest node. 
use all the compute resources. Um, and then every node, like every worker node needs to have the same set of software installed. So the admin has to do something radical where he installs everything uh, for you. He won't let you do it himself or uh, yourself. And I, I guess the biggest issue with it is like, even if you are able to surpass all of these things, it's still not scalable, right? Like that little data center they have going on in your cluster is limited to the number of machines they have, and that's it. Say you exceed that limit, tough luck, go find a new institution, um, right? So that's why we want to replace this with like a cloud-based cloud uh, framework that's easily deployable and scalable on demand, theoretically to infinity. So there's many pieces to this puzzle, right? It's not just like, hey, we can just do this within the click of a button. There's like a few pieces you'd need to understand. So this little picture I made is just showing you guys the different pieces of the puzzle. So we're gonna talk about containers, we're gonna talk about cloud providers, we're gonna talk about parallel computing backends in R, and we're gonna talk about Kubernetes. So let's start with the most important thing. So we need to know how to do parallel computing in R. So this is the first piece of the puzzle. So in R and Bioconductor, let's talk about R first. Like L apply is a very common way to do like map reduce kind of work in R. So the idea is you have a function and you have a list of something, you have a list of objects and you can use the same function on every element or every item in that list. That's pretty much it. And in Bioconductor we have a package called BioC Parallel uh, which essentially does the same thing and the function is called BPL apply. And the only difference here is there's an extra function, extra argument to the function called BP param. Uh, you don't need to pay any attention to BP redo and stuff, but you can change the type of parallel computing backend, which is being used when you use this BPL apply command. So just to delve into this a little bit more, um, so you apply a function to each element on the list or a vector x, and the idea is the return value is also a list of the same length of what you gave it as input. So that's, that's kind of key. Um, and you can change BP param for different backends for parallel evaluation. So I'm gonna talk about like a few different backends so you understand where I'm going with all of this next. So BioC Parallel has different backends. Uh, these are just a few, like the most basic ones are like multi-core param and snow param. So the, so I'll just highlight a couple of the differences here. Um, so multi-core param uses a process uh, called forks. You don't need to understand how it works entirely, but for each parallel thread, um, there needs to be a complete duplication of whatever is happening on the master process with the shared environment. So all the objects and variables which you give need to be copied over, which is why it makes the computing really quick. But one of the major limitations is it's not available on Windows. On the other hand, like sockets, which is run by Snowparam, uh, pretty much works on like all the operating systems, uh, but each thread runs separately without sharing objects and variables. Um, so it needs to be passed by the master process like explicitly for this to work. So it's a little slower uh, because there's like a little bit of a communication overhead between the different processes. And there's this new uh, backend called Redis Param introduced by Martin Morgan and Jeff A. Wang um, which essentially works with a queue data structure called Redis. Uh, Redis does a lot more things, but like we're just using the, this queue type message passing interface, which makes it easier. 
So I just took screenshots from my local machine for each of these different backends. Uh, so you can see that all of them report that I have 14 possible workers left. That's because, so that's, that's happening here. That's because I have a 16 core machine and the way BioC Parallel gives you the number of workers is it's total number minus two. So it'll give me 14, so 16 minus two. So Redis Param is open source. It's available in Bioconductor. It's a new package which is in Bioconductor Devel now. Um, it's an in-memory data structure. Uh, it stores some objects and it's able to pass these objects to different workers in, in that uh, data structure. Um, it's essentially a queue. So whoever goes in first comes out first. It's fairly simple. There's a few packages in R which do this. So one is called Redux, which is in CRAN, um, and Redis Param is in Bioconductor. So how do you use um, Redis Param? So I I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of a demo. Uh, let's see if this works, if I can find my mouse. Can I drag this over? I can't find my mouse. Oh, there we go. There we go. Is this, uh, uh, nope. Is the screen large enough? Like, is the text large enough, the font size? Yes, great. So I'm gonna just start and our process here, just for the sake of demonstration. And I'm gonna split my screen, start another process, uh, split it one more time, start another R process, split it one more time. And I'm gonna start a Redis server. The Redis server is going to act as this message passing interface. Everything on the right hand side you're gonna think of as R processes, which are workers. And on the left-hand side here, you're gonna think of this R process as the master or like manager, right? So I'm gonna say library uh, Redis param. So I'm running uh, Bioconductor 316. Um, so BioC manager version 316, right? So I'm going to make a Redis param for us. So Redis param. And since this is the manager, I'm going to say is dot worker equals false. And I'm going to give it a job name equals test. Oops, I need to give it quotes because it's a string. So you'll see that uh, a Redis param is up, so it created an object. Um, I haven't started it yet, I just created an object. So I'm going to start Redis param. So by default it'll say BPN workers is 1000, which doesn't really mean anything. Uh, but all you need to pay attention to, BP is up, is false. So now when I look at my Redis param object after starting it, after doing BP start is there's zero workers, but it's active. And these two are my workers. So I'm going to say library redis param um, uh, p redis param. If you guys have any questions, like ask me. So this is a worker which I'm initiating. Is dot worker equals uh, true because this is a worker. And since we want it to um, be on the same job, so, so the way they talk to each other is all the process talk to each other through a job name. So I'm gonna say job name equals test. Um, and I'm going to say BP start P. Um, and 
and that's going to happen. And now if I look at P on my um, master or manager node, it's going to say number of workers is one. So Redis is smart enough to figure out when something comes up spontaneously. You don't have to do anything. I'm going to copy the same code and paste it in my second worker and show you guys now the number of workers is two. So just in the interest of time, um, so I have this GitHub repo with some demo scripts. Um, I'm going to just take uh, a function to, which essentially does nothing. All it does is, um, okay, okay. All it does is sleep for a second and gives us a process ID. And then we're going to do some, no, not there, doesn't matter. Uh, we're going to do some parallel work. Uh, BP, L apply, one through four. So we're going to do it four times. So each worker is going to split the job twice. Uh, we're going to run this function foo. Uh, and we're going to give it a backend, which is Redis param. Param equals p. And it should work. So you'll see that each of these processes has a different process ID. So both of them ran it twice. So to fact check that, we can stop our p, stop all. So that's the function to stop the workers from the manager. So if I say RP stop all P, it'll stop the workers. Um, and now if I say sys dot get PID, so this gives us 32244. And if I say sys dot get PID here, 32317. Any questions so far? So this is like a very simple and basic demonstration of Redis param. That's pretty much it, nothing else. Questions, comments? Does anyone have a, has a chat for on, on the WebEx? Maybe we can see if the audience folks have any questions. Go ahead. Uh, it's very nice. Uh, I just uh, wonder if you can say anything about the amount of infrastructure needed on the um, manager and the workers so that Redis is usable. Is it a simple runtime? Redis so you need install? so you need um, Redis to be installed independently. Um, does does Bioconductor installation of Redis param it take care of that for you? No, or it doesn't. You have to do that You'd have to install it separately. Yeah. Okay. All right, jumping back into the slides uh, because there are no questions. Um, we're gonna switch to the next piece of the puzzle which is bioconductor containers. So bioconductor produces Docker containers. Um, these are available on Docker Hub. They're called bioconductor underscore Docker. And we have many releases available as well. So I think everything from release 3.11 is available on the Docker containers for Bioconductor. The latest release is release 3.15 and the Devel image, which is Bioconductor 3.16 is called Devel. So if you wanted to use these Docker images, you would just say Docker pull, Bioconductor, which is the organization name, bioconductor underscore docker, which is the image or container name. And then in these square parentheses, I'm just trying to demonstrate like the different tags which are available for these images. Uh, if you wanted to use devel, you'd use devel. If you wanted to use a release version, you'd say all caps release underscore three and release number. The advantage of these docker images are um, they have all the system dependencies including Redis, uh, which Vince just alluded to, available on them already. So you wouldn't have to install anything separately. And all the Bioconductor packages would install by default. 
I say 99%, uh, but it's closer to like 99.7% or something. Um, and the other huge advantage of using Bioconductor Docker images are you get binary packages for free. So when you just say BioC Manager install, um, you would get the latest binary packages of all Bioconductor packages available to you. You wouldn't have to compile it on your local infrastructure. They're seven to eight times faster in terms of installation. Um, Docker images are very cross-platform, so you, no matter what inf like operating system you use, Windows, Mac, Linux, it's available to you. And you get RStudio on the front end, or going forward, it's gonna be called Posit, I believe. Um, so that's like, that's like one of the, sec that's the second piece of the puzzle. So we've learned about parallel computing, some basics about that. We've learned about Docker containers, which Bioconductor produces. And now we need to know what Kubernetes is. Um, so we have these containers. Um, when we deploy these containers on our cloud system or like on multiple different nodes, we don't want to have to install everything separately. We want a piece of software which does all of that for us. So when we use Kubernetes, it orchestrates everything for us. So it'll launch the same Docker image on all of these different nodes that are available. It'll make sure these images like don't suddenly like, these containers don't suddenly break or fail. So it makes sure everything is running smoothly. They're fail safe in the event something goes down, it'll bring it back up. Um, and you can do rolling updates. That's not that essential, but the idea is if you want to make, an, make a change to your image, you can make it on the fly. So Kubernetes essentially handles like deployment, scaling, management of any containerized application. So in our containerized application is this Bioconductor Docker image. Any questions regarding this? All right. So I'll just introduce some uh, verbiage of like Kubernetes here. Uh, so a node, when I say a node, it's the actual virtual machine or the compute instance which is on the cloud. So this is a, a computer quite literally at a data center and that's going to do stuff for you. Um, a pod, think of it as like one container, just to make it easy. It's the most basic deployable object in Kubernetes, but you don't need to really understand it that well. Just think of it as like one container, or like, yeah, one container is good. Um, and a cluster, when I say a cluster, it's like your entire Kubernetes um, deployment uh, on your cloud. Um, a volume mount is stuff where you store things so you can mount a volume to any of your Docker images on your local machine or on the cloud and you can store things on it. So you can connect all of your pods to the same volume mount. And there's this uh, piece of software called Helm which acts as sort of a package manager for Kubernetes application and K8S is the abbreviation for Kubernetes. So don't get confused because of that. So just to demonstrate like this, um, these new terms again. So there is a Kubernetes API, which you use on your local machine, on your command line, and that the command is essentially kubectl or kube control. Um, that's the API which you, or SDK which you install on your machine to manage your cluster. And once your cluster comes up uh, on the cloud, so you have a cluster with three nodes here, so three literal machines, three computers which are running stuff on the cloud. And think of each pod here as one Docker container doing something different. So node three has like three containers doing stuff, node two has two containers, node one has one container. And they can all talk to each other or not, they can be doing different things, but this is the idea of a cluster. Questions? No. Okay, so I'll talk about this um, 
bioconductor uh, Kubernetes Redis cluster now. Uh, and this is like the general architecture of it. So um, let's, let's think about it from the user point of view. So a user would start a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, he or she would install um, a Helm chart on this cluster. So we give you a Helm package of sorts with this application. Sorry, I keep bumping into the mic. Um, we give you a Helm package. So you would install it on this cluster which you start on the cloud of your choice. And you would connect to your manager node, um, which essentially is running our studio on the front end for you to interact with it. And you would just say BPL apply uh, and send some jobs to your workers, right? Like you could choose the number of workers you deploy and you would just send some jobs to the workers. And the way these jobs are sent is through Redis. So now let's talk about this cluster a little bit. So in this example, you have like three nodes um, and you have a manager which is running R in our studio um, and our studio is your front end. So you have that as your application in your browser. And in the back end, you have like five workers here and your manager is able to send five, jo uh, five workers a job of whatever size. And um, you also have a Redis pod and an NFS pod, which is essentially uh, different software. NFS is like a network file system and all of your pods are connected to that file system. So that means that the underlying file system which each of your manager and worker see is the same so they can share information. So there's no uh, transmission of information from one place to another, so there's no like uh, latency in like message passing. Object passing, I should say. Um, so this is the idea of a cluster, and this little cloud is essentially indicating that all of this is on someone else's computer <laughs> on the cloud. Questions, comments? All right. Can we check if there's any questions on the live chat? No. I can try and join it, like socio. Okay, great. Thank you. So next is the the cloud provider. Um, so you can launch this on Google Cloud, Microsoft, or AWS. And uh, this Helm chart is available at this location here. And this is work by Alex Mahmood, who's at the back of the room. He's giving a, a demo, I believe, tomorrow. So be sure to attend it if you would like. Friday. Friday. He's giving the demo on Friday. <laughs> so be sure to attend it on Friday. <laughs> um, so the main advantages of using any of these cloud providers are they're on demand, customizable. They have like a you know, they have like a mechanism to run your Kubernetes applications and so on and so forth. They're fairly advanced. Everyone is using it for everything now. Right, so we just get into the demo. Um, this is gonna take a while, so bear with me. I'm gonna launch everything live so that there's no, uh, there's no like difference between what I'm doing and what I'm showing you guys. So these are the requirements if you wanted to like run it yourself. So you would need a cloud provider. For that, you would need a credit card or someone funding you. You need a Helm chart, which we are providing. You need Kubernetes, which is available on the cloud. You need Redis Param, which is being provided by Bioconductor. So this is the user flow. So I'm gonna start the Kubernetes cluster on Google Cloud. Uh, the Google Kubernetes engine, GKE. Um, and I'm going to install this, this BioC configuration with the Helm chart. <laughs> um, connect to the manager, deploy some R code using this BPL apply function with Redis Param, gather the results and delete the cluster. That's the goal at least. So now let's let's see if this um, demo works. 
So this is where the script is to run this stuff. So hopefully nothing bad happens. Um, so I'll just uh, stop all of these guys because we don't need them. These are all like local machine things, but we are now going to the cloud. So I have a, a demo script. Um, uh, it's called multi-node cluster launch. Um, and I will put that up here so we can cheat a little bit. Um, here we go. So first I need to log into my Google Cloud account. Um, and I'm going to do that. Um, great. So now I'm authenticated with my Google Cloud account. Um, maybe I should just look from here. And then I can start my uh, Kubernetes cluster on Google Cloud. So for the sake of this demo, I'm going to launch a cluster with two nodes of E2 medium size. And that means it's like a four core machine. So I'm going to launch two VMs with four cores. Right. Um, there we go. So now it'll launch the cluster, which is gonna take a second or two, maybe three, four minutes actually. So if you have any questions, now is the time to ask. Anything is fair game. This is gonna take a while, guys. That's why I asked for 90 minutes. <laughs> yeah, so my question is, uh, you mentioned you have four cores in each machine. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you have a process that uses one core, that you are wasting three cores. Right. So can you use Redis to parallelize within the machines? You scale up and down as needed. Okay. And yes. They, and they share objects when they are running on the same machine and not share when they are running. So you can scale them. Uh, there's like commands in Kubernetes to help you scale, but there's no like auto scaling right now. Okay. That's, that's what you meant by is it smart enough to like shut down nodes and stuff? Is that, was that your question? So it, it was more about the object sharing and, and environment sharing. Because if you have like, I don't know, a huge Surat object or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to copy it. Um, it will the object, up. no, the object doesn't get copied. Like you're working on the same uh, file system underneath for all the workers and the ma manager. Yeah. So there's no copying happening. But anymore. like it has to be in the memory, right? Right. So, so, so it, it needs to duplicate in the memory. That's what I mean. That's what I'm saying. Like, so you copy it once to this file system mm -hmm. and it's all your nodes and your objects. Your object has access to like the manager and the worker. It's just happening once. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I think it, it may be worth pointing out that there is another package that's relevant here called shared object. And uh, I haven't used it, but I think that may be where you're going, that you do not want to have replication if these machines are connected memory-wise. And the shared object package, which is by Jeff A. Wang, uh, should accomplish that for you. Um, Nitesh, have you done anything with that? I have never yeah. used shared object. So there's, there's infrastructure to help with that. I don't think it's been exercised very heavily. So if you want to discuss that, I think we can make something go. I, I think Alex has a comment. So with the network file system, it, for each pod, they basically think that the object that I think it gets serialized, right? Right. It gets serialized to the network file system. And then if it's on the same node, it will just have a cache on that node and just use it directly. If it's on a different node, it will send it to the Kubernetes internal network from one to the other. but from the perspective of each pod, it 
thinks that it's localized and the network right. file system just deals with actually moving the data from one node to another. Right, so but, but from the user point of view, that there isn't that much latency. Like, um, but yeah, any more questions? Hey, Mitesh, yeah. or Tagaro from Nanostream. Um, I did have some questions. So this is kind of like a job manager. In some cases, like when you're doing first thing first out queue, right? So how much job managing can, can you actually do with this? So um, it's not meant to be like um, you deploy a job. So it's more for interactive computing. So the way more most people use R is you want to do something interactive on the fly. Even the BPL apply command, like most people use it. Like, I mean, you can use it in a workflow and like let it sleep overnight and do a lot of things. But like, this is like, I'm going to deploy a job and I want my results back now. Okay. That's the idea. Yeah. I, I don't know if I answered your question really. Yeah, no, no, that's okay. Yeah. And then um, for BPL apply, uh, have you tried with actually running? multiple different functions? Like what if I wanted to set up pods with different containers and run different things on all the different containers? You could at do the same that. Time? Okay. You could do that. Okay. You'd have to design your own cluster though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you could do that. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, this is taking longer than usual because of the Wi Fi. <laughs> so I encourage more questions. Yeah, for sure. Oh. I have a question, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, aside from Google, AWS, and the other one that's escaping me, are there any other like Azure? Yeah. yeah. Are there any other cloud service providers that are, that you know of, or that are good, or that aren't? Yeah, so I think IBM has its own cloud. Okay. Uh, there's DigitalOcean, there's Alibaba, there's OpenStack, which is uh, an open source. Um, it's not free, but it's open source. <laughs> um, and then you have like, I think NS NSF uh, sponsored clouds as well, like Jetstream, uh, which are like for researchers. You, you'd apply with a grant or something and like you'd get some service units um, as credits and you would use those. Yeah. Awesome. Aside from all the benefits that are associated with using like a Kubernetes platform and the learning curve, I guess, what are some of the drawbacks do you think? Uh, so I, I think the biggest drawback is like you know, the expertise you have to develop in like, so if you remember like my initial puzzle, so there's like different components you'd have to like gain like some expertise in to like be able to like launch and take down and avoid like excessive spending. So if you, that would be one of the, but Vince might have a better one. Oh, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think the whole problem of debugging in this context becomes a, a very uh, potentially confusing and difficult situation. That's why we are thinking about this idea of a um, development services so that you don't, I mean, so that Bioconductor can help you experiment with these things in a very low cost or zero cost environment. And that's a very new set of facilities that we have. And I think if we follow what Natasha is doing, you see your first experiment, and then I don't know if you ever are going to demonstrate how something can crash and what you do to recover, but those are the kinds of things we need a lot more experience with. Yeah. So yeah, that's like some, that's where the expertise in like Kubernetes uh, comes into play, and like just being able to like navigate like these cloud providers' dashboards and stuff. Um, yeah, that's a big big thing. Yeah. But uh, uh, coming back to the demo, we see that the cluster has launched. Um, it's called my GKE cluster. 
and you'll see that um, it's launched in US East 1B. Uh, the machine type is E2 medium, the number of nodes are two, and the status is running right now. We want to attach a, a, a disk to this so that we have access. So all the nodes can, uh, all the nodes have access to the same disk or a persistent disk per se. So if you have some data you compute on, on your cloud service, and you want to keep this disk after your computation because the data is too large, you can just keep this disk available to you on the cloud for as long as you need. So it's like, it's going to be there. You can take up and down the cluster, you can create and delete the cl cluster, but you can keep the persistent disk. So we'll do that. Um, great. So that, that's what happened just now. Um, I've selected a disk of under 200 gigs for IO performance. So this is a demo. You can do more or less depending on what you want. And it'll give you, uh, once it's created, it'll say, hey, this persistent disk has been created in this zone. This is the size and the status is ready. So once that's done, you would actually, um, you'd need to like get some credentials from the cloud to do something on your local machine to pass some commands and stuff. So this is, so this G cloud container clusters get credentials is saying that, hey, Google cloud, give me some credentials from this cluster so that I can run some commands and do stuff with it. So it'll say fetching cluster endpoint and authentication data and cube config is, uh, now ready. So when I say kubectl um, get all, so it'll show you this cluster is active and it'll show you two nodes. Right, so you, you'll see that the cluster is active and uh, so I, I'd still need to launch my actual like Helm application and this is what so this does that. I'll just walk through what each of these lines mean. So the first line is saying like, um, I don't think it's, so the first line is just saying like Helm is the name of the command line software. Um, you're installing this application onto your cluster. You're giving it a name. It's called my Redis demo. And each worker is, so I'm going to set the number of workers in this cluster, I'm choosing three. And instead of 314, I'll say 315. Um, I need to use a bioconductor image uh, version. So instead of devel, uh, so instead of release, I can use like devel. So I can say 316 here and three, um, I guess the thing would be devel. Or I'm not sure actually. So let's just use 315 um, for the sake of the demo. And I created a persistent disk. So everything in my cluster needs to be attached to the same disk. So we're gonna give it the name of the disk. Um, don't worry about that. Uh, don't worry about that. And this is the name of the application, GKE Helm Chart Demo. And we'll remove the weight. Uh, that is because I need to go back one and try that again, yeah. So that's going to install this Helm chart um, on my GKE cluster. So it's going to take a minute. Um, so now if I say kubectl get all, you'll see that it's creating all of these um, containers, so what that means is each pod is going to pull the correct container and run it on the cluster. Uh, and this is also going to take a while. So any more questions? <laughs> Did you build a helm chart? No, uh, that's, a, that's a really good point, yes. So we can just go through the Helm chart a little bit here. So in this GitHub repo, there's this GKE Helm chart demo. So if I click that, you'll see um, 
templates and values. So the template is essentially a template of the Kubernetes application and the values are like pre-configured values, like default values, but all of these are configurable, of course. So you'll see what exactly is happening in terms of like um, what's being run. Um, so these are pre-templated values. Um, and this is the config file for my manager deployment. Um, so I don't know if you guys are uh, familiar with like uh, these configuration files, but the idea is we need to tell the manager pod like what container to pull down. So that's being given, like you're giving an image name and a tag and you're giving it like an image pull policy, which is like, hey, always give me the latest image. So we'll just say always, that's, that's one of the options there. And then you're gonna tell it like what volumes need to be mounted. Like there's an NFS type uh, persistent disk that's being mounted. And our studio is the application running on the front end. So you need to give it like a, a username and a password. Um, so this is the password which you can pass into it. And the name of the value is called password. Um, it's not actually password. <laughs> uh, it, and it, so since it's a web application, it needs to be hosted on a port of some sort. So 8787 is going to be the port we choose. And if you have anything extra you want to do, like any extra commands that need to be deployed, um, like run a command, like you can just say R script E and give it some job and like just deploy it. So that will be passed into this location here and it'll run that job for you automatically. And this restart policy says if it fails, pull it up again, like restart it. It's pretty much the same. So you will have like a config file for the manager. You'll have a config file for your NFS. Uh, you'll have config files for your Redis services, our studio and your worker. Yeah, yeah this, is, um, this is where things get difficult for me. Yeah. And I'm just, you see, you've called this GKE Helm chart demo. Mm -hmm. And it really seems like uh, a significant product, yeah. that, that code base sitting there with mm -hmm. all those defaults and that entire logical structure about right. how to kick things off, essentially your Helm install command, right? You've overridden a lot of those parameters. Right. So is this regarded as a software product? You call it demo, but it seems to me that you know this has to be a kind of tested infrastructure with validation and so forth. Sure. Are you looking at it in that way? So there's a package called BioC cube install, um, which is probably like uh, a little advanced for this um, section, but in the uh, inst folder of this package, there is a Helm chart, which is essentially the canonical one it does the exact same thing, what we're doing now. But the reason I pulled it out of here is to avoid the complexity of what this Helm chart is doing and like um, just show folks a simpler Helm chart. But I agree with you in the sense that it is a product that can be evaluated, tested, and delivered in a better way. Um, I don't know if Alex can speak to that a little bit more. Like, I mean, we do have uh, Bioconductor Helm. We do have Bioconductor Helm, uh, which does everything for a single node cluster. Um, and it'll teach you exactly how to launch stuff. Uh, and you can launch it on your local machine, on a Minikube cluster. So Minikube is essentially doing whatever Kubernetes is doing on your local machine. Um, on Azure, Google uh, Kubernetes Engine, and AWS Elastic Kubernetes Service, and like all the instructions are in there. I think Alex had a comment. Yeah. I think the, oh, sorry. Uh, I think the, 
like the chart that was made for privacy cube install is a really good proof of concept but, uh, and it has like the NFS that is mm -hmm. all of that deployed within that chart. Um, I think moving forward in order to not have to, for us to maintain NFS that is, uh, we're gonna try to take the bioconductor helm chart put dependencies on and right. that there's an NFS maintained by the Kubernetes communities that uh, that's the NFS Ganesha um, there's a uh, this uh, chart that is maintained by Bitnami right. which, um, and try to use those as dependencies right. but kind of offload the maintenance requirement going Burn forward them, for yeah. the other services so yeah. we would only maintain the bioconductor helm chart link it to the other ones and right. put the necessary linkage but not have to maintain the full stack ourselves. Right. Yeah, so you would add dependencies. So what Alex is essentially saying is like, we do a lot of work on that Helm chart and we don't need to. We can pass off all the maintenance of the Redis config, NFS config to folks who are experts in that and just add dependencies in this YAML file here saying like, you know, Redis from here, NFS from there, and they would do stuff for us. But let's check on our cluster. Okay, so our cluster is up and running, great. Um, oh. Oh, of, of course. Um, so uh, if they can hear me, and they have the slides, uh, they probably don't. But if they, um, let's see. So if my, I'm hoping my screen is being shared, but like these are the links to GitHub. Take a screenshot, or I don't have the chat open. So guys, take a screenshot. <laughs> In five, four, three, two, one. All right. All right, um, so this is, this is great. So now that we have uh, this available, uh, where is my example? No, demo, multi-node. Great, so we have our Kubernetes application up and running. Um, and now the idea is I need to get my RStudio link. So there's this little, a very handy command here uh, you don't actually need it, but it's kind of handy. But if you remember, like the port we deployed was 8787. And if you say kubectl get all, your RStudio uh, load balancer will assign an IP address to you, an external IP address, and it's going to be this one. More likely than not, we won't be able to access this right now because of the firewall, but we'll try anyway. Oh, hey, we can. So the password I set is BioC, and the username is RStudio. Um, hopefully we'll be able to log in. So my backup is if it doesn't work, I'll switch to my wireless hotspot on my phone, but it, it seems to be working. So the RStudio server is up, and you'll see that uh, BioC manager version as we chose it is um, 3.16. Uh, did we choose 3.16? Okay, we did, okay. Um, and it's available to us. Um, so this is using a bioconductor Docker container. So if I wanted to install a package, so, and I just say BioC manager install, I would get a binary package. Now I wouldn't get anything, any source package to compile. So for example, if I were to say rhtslib, uh, it would just happen super quick. There might be a few packages, but like, I just wanted to show you guys like a demonstration of like the binary package installation. Give it a second. <laughs> I see. Um, let's let's 
check it out. Um, Vince is right. We did set 315. Um, okay, yes. So the workers are always getting three. So the workers are getting 315, but the manager is always like Devel. So as soon as you send the work, it doesn't actually matter like what version the manager is on. The manager can be a different version and the workers can be a different version, but they'll still talk to each other. Um, but essentially like, uh, thank you for pointing that out that I forgot that little piece of information there. But you'll see here on the installation that um, it just pulls the container from uh, a binary store, an object store on Google Cloud, and it doesn't do anything. It just unpacks it, and it'll say installing binary package, and it's done. It doesn't actually compile anything, so it's very fast. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yes. I don't want to dwell on this, but let's just. So you 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 made it seem as if it's okay that the ma manager has 3.16, but the workers mm -hmm. have 3.15. Mm -hmm. Is it? What if you had an object that uh, was sort of a 3.16 dependent S4? Yeah, then it would be an issue. You would have some problems, right? Yeah. So I think the, the a check on consistency right. of bioconductor version should be a default uh, as this thing goes forward. Right, absolutely. Change it, yeah. So I just wanted to like demo this um, multi-pod or multi-node parallel computing on the cloud. So we have two nodes. We have like uh, I think three workers. So I have this like demo script. So I'm going to say the number of workers is three here. I'm going to name my job uh, binary build um, because that's hard-coded for whatever reason. Um, and so this, I'm gonna run this like 13 times over three workers. So that's going to be, uh, so one worker is going to run it five times, another worker is gonna run it five times, and the next worker is gonna run it three times. Um, and we're gonna do a BPL apply after starting Redis param. Everyone with me, this is exactly like the Redis param we ran earlier. So we're gonna load the library Redis param. Redis server is being run by a pod, so we don't have to start a Redis server. And this manager node and the worker nodes know already that that Redis server is active. So we're gonna set some system variables to make sure that the right environment variables are being detected start Redis param, um, and you'll see that uh, it recognizes the number of workers as three because you're gonna give it three workers. Um, it hasn't started up yet, but BPL apply, once you run it, it'll automatically start it. So if I were to say BP start P, it would know so that there's three workers available. And then we're gonna run the same function essentially, which is sleep for a second, and then give me the node name. Like it's not a process ID anymore, it's the name of an actual machine which is running. So that's, we're gonna call it a fun function. Um, and then we're gonna time it so that we know how long it slept. So in five seconds, we should have three workers report to us. That's the idea. We're going to give it like an uneven number, like an odd number of workers, uh, odd number of jobs so that um, we know that everything is happening correctly. And we're going to time it with system.time. Uh, and we're going to say BPL apply 1 through 13. And um, you'll see that the elapsed time is like 5 seconds, uh, 5.422. And if I were to say, um, so res will look like a list and we don't want to look at that. What we want to do is we want to like unlist it and then tabulate it so that we can see 
how many seconds or like how many jobs each worker ran. So you'll see that each work cluster, um, so two of them run five times and one runs three times. So that's the idea behind uh, this, I guess. And to fact check that the names of the work clusters are correct, so you can compare the names here to what Kubernetes gives you back, and you'll see that um, they match. This and uh, I guess this are the same. So you've launched the cluster, you've done some work on it. Now I guess the next big step is to like take it down because if you don't, you're gonna keep getting billed and that's, that's the biggest thing. So you have to delete your uh, Kubernetes application first. You say, um, so Helm status my Redis demo, you can say that and it'll show that it's up. Um, so you have to delete it now. So you'll say Helm delete. It'll delete everything on the Kubernetes cluster. You have to delete that persistent disk unless you want to retain the information on that disk. But since we haven't done any useful computation, we can delete it. Uh, and I'll say yes. So that'll happen in the background. And then you also have to delete these two word, uh, these two compute instances or nodes so that uh, your VMs aren't just running. So that'll, you can also do that with gcloud container clusters delete and it's all, it's all gone from the cloud now. Let's say deleting and that's, I guess, do I have anything else? Yes, I do have something else. <laughs> So I, I just wanted to talk about like an example application, which we've been using for a while now. And I showed you a demonstration of these binary packages being delivered to you guys. And that is one of the ma biggest applications of, um, of this Helm chart. So the way we do it is we compute a dependency graph of all the R packages in Bioconductor and we make it a parallelizable process. So in this depth first search graph, um, if you see level zero, that's a package. All the packages with no dependencies are level zero. Level one is all the packages with like one dependency. Level two is all the packages with two dependencies and so on and so forth. So when we pass these packages to be built, on the Kubernetes cluster, we pass it based on the level. And what happens is like the workers get one package every time you pass a level in. So if we have 50 workers and we have like 500 uh, level zero packages, it would give in 50 first. As soon as one finishes, it would get like 51, 52 and so on and so forth. There's no uh, latency there. And then once level zero is done, level one, two, three, so on and so forth. It goes up to like level 17, I think. Um, and we use the same cluster architecture to put it to work in the background on the cloud. And we store these binaries on an object store in the Google Cloud and we deliver it to folks. So this BioC cube install package, which I demo, uh, which I showed you guys, uses Redis Param, works on the Google Cloud um, so it, it essentially uses all the pieces of the puzzle I just demonstrated. It has parallel computing, Kubernetes, cloud availability and cloud infrastructure. You need to know something about that. And you also need to know some Kubernetes, yeah. I just want to give acknowledgements to like uh, folks on the team here, like Martin Morgan, Vince, uh, Jeff A. Wang, Marcel Ramos and Alex Mahmoud. Um, it, takes a lot of people to get this, this sort of work done. And that's it. If you have any questions, ask me. Uh, we still have like 25 minutes, so questions, comments?